So also on topic 15, we have warehousing, storing the goods. So when we get the stuff in, how do we deal with it? Or if it's going across the country, it's probably not staying on the same truck the whole time from point A, let's say in California, all the way to New York City. So there's st maybe stops in between which have warehouses. And we'll talk about that as we move on. But what do these distribution centers or warehouses offer to add value to the customer? Well, there's a thing called break bulk, mixing and assorting, storing, a free trade zone, customization, final assembly, returns process, and repair or refurbish. So break bulk. So let's say you have five pallets that has 500 items total. Well, might be only 50 going to one destination. So the, the distribution center could break down your pallets into smaller shipments and have them continue on to their destination. That's a service they offer. So mixing and assorting. So if you think about all these possible, all these different products, you know, have you ever bought something that had like four or five different items with it, like as a kit or something like that? Well, a distribution center can take all the separate items and put them into kits and then send them on to wherever they need to go. They can also, as a warehouse, they can store things, you know, put it up on a rack and store it. So being a free trade zone, this one's a little unique. So we have customs houses that you can have something shipped into the country and it might sit in this customs warehouse and it technically has not entered the country when it comes to terms of uh, being taxed or you know the tariffs or the all these other things that you might have to pay. Technically it hasn't arrived when it's sitting in a customs warehouse. However, these customs warehouses have to be approved by the customs agency, right? So every country has their own way of doing this. So if you're going to ship things to other countries, make sure that whoever you may be using for this service is legitimate because you don't want to have the, the other country's government or your own government coming after you for something that you've done along these lines because you use the wrong warehouse. So we can customize, you know, just kind of like the mixing and assorting, we might be able to customize saying, okay, we want this package to have seven of these, but we want four red, two blue, and three green, or whatever number they need to be. So a break bulk warehouse can, or a, break, a distribution center can do this. It's kind of a combination of break bulk, mix and assorting to get this customization. We also have final assembly. Some distribution centers, can put uh, take your items do the final assembly so you have a full product so you might have products coming from different places and they can come to the warehouse and be put all together and that could be your final product that gets then shipped out to your customers returns one of the one of the things that comes along with uh, having a store is returns so you might be able to use these locations as a return receiving center where they can evaluate the item and see, okay, this is still good, this can still be sold, or no, this can't be sold, and they can decide that, or you decide it, however you set it up, and then dispose of the product however it is, whether it gets resold, or it gets donated, or it gets thrown in the trash, or recycled, whatever the outcome is. But they can also provide repair or refurbished servicing too. Not everything that comes back from returns can just go straight onto the shelf again in another store. They might just need to be repaired a little bit or refurbished. You know, there might have been something wrong and they had to open it up and connect a wire that got disconnected and now it's repaired and they might be able to sell it as refurbished. So if you look around, some websites have renewed or refurbished products that you can buy that's usually about 10 to 20 percent cheaper than a brand new product. So this is where that happens. Or the company does it themselves, but it might be better for a third-party logistics distribution center to do that. So we have different types of warehouses and these I would make sure you know. So a warehouse is just a general term for where products are stored. 
They can be, I mean, you can have a room in your house that's called a warehouse because it's just where product is stored. A distribution center, so sometimes called a mixing facility because they'll take products from different shipments, combine them into one, and then send that shipment on. Think about a grocery store. You know, they don't just get one box of a salad dressing, for example, and send that on to the grocery store, you know, the distribution sending it on to the grocery store. No, they're going to combine that salad dressing, maybe with some yogurts and some other things, and put it on a pallet and then send that one pallet to the store. So that pallet might have 50 different items on it. So cross stock. You know, products are coming in one side and then immediately loading onto another trailer to go to their next destination. A brake bulk. I've already mentioned brake bulk, but we're taking a truck that's maybe going from one, one large shipment and broken down and then delivered using less than truckload. Or it can go UPS, FedEx, at whatever that stage is. And then we have that uh, customs warehouse. So when we're importing or exporting materials, if it ends up in a customs warehouse, which we pay a fee for that it being stored there, we're delaying the taxes that would be associated with that product based on the country's uh, tariffs and other fees that may be associated with that. So let's, let's talk about cross docking because some people have difficulty with this. So here's an image of a cross dock. So you can think of it like an airport. Let's say you have a connecting flight. So you're flying out of Pittsburgh and you're going to go through Charlotte and then you're going to go on to your destination. Well, think of this like the Charlotte airport. So your, your plane comes in, you're, you get off the plane, and then you scramble because probably, if you're like me, probably made the connecting flight too close and the plane was late. So you're scrambling to your gate. And then you get on that plane and then that plane takes off. It's the same thing when it comes to cross docking. The, the materials come off one truck, it gets split up and put on other trucks, depending on where those trucks are going. And here we have an area for problem freight. Let's say the label got ripped off the pallet or the pallet is broken somehow, like this, the, uh, the shrink wrap that went around it, it got broken and now it's all over the floor. So it would go into the problem freight to get fixed up. And you know, there's a fee for that. If, you're, if your company didn't ship it right, there's a fee for them to fix that. And then we have a breakdown freight. So think about that mixing and matching, uh, the customization, the kitting, all that kind of stuff might happen in, in this area. So if you think about that, it's just like an airport. It's a, it, a connecting airport for you because you're going in, coming off of one plane and going on to another plane. Or if you use a bus, you know, you get on the bus, it goes to a, a let's say, a uh, terminal in Pittsburgh. Then you get on another bus and go on to New York City or any other place. Same thing with rail. You know, you might get off at one and then get on another. Uh, the bus is the same way. Subways. So it's a very common thing. This is just for freight, for our products. So... How do we make sure the information moves around with all this stuff? Well, we have what is called a warehouse management system. So a warehouse management system talks to our retail or manufacturers in a warehouse. So we can find out such as telling the retailer, hey, this stuff is getting shipped to you. So here's the advanced shipping notice. So the retailer knows, okay, on Thursday I should get this stuff. But the warehouse also gets noticed from the manufacturer when the manufacturer sends it to the warehouse. And then with the retailer, you know, you buy items at Walmart or Kroger or any of these other stores, they're gonna, these retailers are telling the manufacturer, usually through that point of sale system, hey, you know, we just sold some Lucky Charms, so we need to order Lucky Charms. So we're gonna let the manufacturer know that we're doing that. So that way, you complete the loop and everybody's aware of what's going on. So our warehouse management system does more than just that though. 
So it, we have our receiving, order picking, verification, and our shipping. So this is the actual putting, dealing with the inventory that we have. So receiving, you know, we confirm that we receive it. We put some labels on it to tell it where it's going to go in our warehouse. And we tell it where to go, whether it's going to go into our active reserve or ambient storage or refrigerated storage. All that is determined when we receive the item. And then order picking. You know, some orders are more important than others. So those orders get pushed to the front of the queue. So somebody goes and gets them and other orders might be delayed a little bit depending on the priority. You know, if it's a, you know, a big customer such as Walmart, you probably want to get that shipment out the door before you deal with a smaller customer. So order picking, we need to print a pick ticket. That tells you what exactly you're going to get. Think of this as a packing list. You might have gotten packing lists in your shipments before. And then we'll print the necessary labels. It might be a shipping label, all this other kind of stuff that gets included, but not yet put on a box yet, let's say. Verification. So we need to make sure we're putting the right stuff in boxes. So we might scan the barcodes, make sure we're going to the right location and we're getting the right product and grab it and putting it in our cart. Well, we're making sure that it's correct. So finally, shipping. So many warehouse management systems will recommend a shipping method based on certain criteria, such as weight, the distance to the destination, the urgency or the shipping speed, all these different things. And then they can say, okay, here's our shipping documents. Maybe it's a UPS label, FedEx label, whatever. And it calculates the shipping cost. Somebody's got to pay for shipping. So this is how it's done. So how do we set up our warehouse for a case pick operation? So this is where we're grabbing the full box and shipping the full box. Well, here, here's an example. So we might have some bay doors here that we can send it through. You know, the truck backs up, forklift goes in and grabs pallets, and it gets put in our reserve storage. So it's either our ambient storage or our refrigerated storage. And it's usually just left as a pallet. We're not breaking anything down yet. But as our order picking bins get low, we might take it out of the advanced, out of our storage area and move it to our bins. So now it's in our active storage. Active meaning we're actively grabbing things from these locations. And you might have a conveyor belt, you might have other systems, it might be people just going back there, walking back there and grabbing it. However it is, then it's staged for shipping. It's put in a box, it's put a, labels on the box, and now you're just waiting for UPS or FedEx or you know, any, the truck to come and get your shipment. So we have a lot of common outsourced activities here. So how, what are some of these things that we outsource in logistics? Well, transportation planning, 71%. Our data interchange, that's 68%. Visibility, warehousing, transportation scheduling, all these different things we can outsource. So, but what are some things that, uh, or some other things? Well, what about our web portal? You know, you go to ups.com, you can, that's a web portal. Our customs processing. Usually you want to get somebody who's very familiar with the laws and they'll do the paperwork, they'll do everything else to make sure your shipment goes through without any problems. Sometimes these people are called customs brokers. So barcoding, you know, you have to make sure you get the right barcode on the right product, the right pallet or right shipment. Transportation sourcing. Well, if you don't have your own private fleet, you need to find trucks to move your products. So it could be going to a transportation broker where you just tell them this is the product, this is its size, this is its weight, and it's going to this location. Simple as that. And they'll come back with some pricing and you just say, okay, this one. And then they tell you what day they'll, the truck will get there to pick it up and you just make sure you have the proper paperwork and everything ready for them to take it away. Network optimization. This in and of itself is a specialization in supply chain, trying to optimize the network. 
So this is a you know huge amount of data trying to figure out the best way to do things. Is it better to go A, B, C in your destinations? Or is it better to go A, C, B? Or maybe even start with C? You know, trying to figure out the best way to do that. Data mining tools. Well, if, if you're getting into the management information systems, this is huge big data. And you really can't get much bigger than this because there's so much in logistics. And some people really like that area of it. So all of these are things that we can commonly outsource. But why? And you know what what would make us decide to outsource? So we need to look at the activities we consciously outsource. What do we already outsource? You know, and what made what motivated us to do that? Is it because we're not experts in that and we don't want to screw it up? Or is it because we don't have time to do that? To develop the skills or we're just, you know, recognize we can't handle that. So we're going to go ahead and give it to somebody else who's an expert, let them do it. So there's a lot of different motivational factors when it comes to this. So, and each time you consider outsourcing, you need to figure it out. You know, can you develop the skills yourself or do you just need to go ahead and start with somebody else as an outsource? You might start outsourcing and then develop the skills in to make and develop the skills in-house and then you insource or you bring it in-house so you do it yourself. So that that's kind of a nutshell of what we're talking about here, you know, the, the logistics side of it. So why don't we talk more about the third party logistics and what they do? So that's our next topic. So let's go ahead and move on to that one.